How are you tonight? Good to have you. Welcome if you're joining us online. Today was a great day. We certainly had a lot of, uh, a lot of ministry opportunity, a lot of fun uh, doing Serve Day. We do that once a year. We got to come and do that together. Those of you who joined us, thank you so much. Uh, it, was, uh, it was great. Um, we are in a series that we're talking about prayer. And the reason is because our country needs, uh, needs us as Christ followers. Uh, we, uh, we, we need to respond in a godly way to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit, to be able to, to uh, connect in with God, and we need one another. And God uses prayer as a, as a major vehicle in order to inspire us and to help us. So that's why we're doing that, and we're in week four of this prayer series. Now, I was thinking about prayer for myself, things that get me jacked, and I'm excited about prayer. I want to pray. I look forward to it. My prayers are vibrant, and, and, and you know, for me, and see if this is true for you, the thing that gets me the most fired up about prayer is answered prayer. I mean, when I get a string of answered prayer, and just I've prayed about several things, and they just God's blessings have just are coming my way, and heaven is opened up. That just gets me excited. I'm thinking, man, oh man, it's just like, you know, it's it's happening. And that gets, you know, I'm kind of like we looked at Exodus 17 with Moses, how he was, you know, that's I think we started the the, the series that way, where he was when he was when he would lift up his rod, lift up his hands. He would, you know, things were victorious. That's how I felt, you know. But the thing that gets me the most not interested in prayer, it's kind of like last on my list, I hate to say. And I'm not very excited. There's not a lot of joy in my prayer life. Is a string of unanswered prayer. Doesn't that kind of like take it out of your, your sails? I mean, just like, What's up with that? You know, I mean, just kind of like you prayed for that. That didn't happen. You prayed for that. That didn't happen. And then you just think, well, what's, what's the use? And I think we've all been through that. You know, when you're in that situation, what do you do? Well, you know, if you were to buy a new lawnmower and you're all excited about it, you can't wait for the rain to come to, so your grass will grow. Finally, the rain comes. You start mowing. You get about halfway through the job and the lawnmower conks out on you. And you're like pulling the yanking, and about 20 minutes into it, you know, some carnality starts coming out, and 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 you're thinking, I'm gonna just throw this thing away, and I'm gonna bash it with a with a hammer or or something, and then you think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me get the instructions out and see what it says. Maybe it's the carburetor, maybe it's the spark plug, maybe there's something that I need to you know, look at, and you open it up and you start trying to troubleshoot. Well, that's how we should respond when we are in a place of unanswered prayer, because there are things that can block our prayer life. I mean, there's time, there, there's actual reasons why we get these roadblocks, where we get a string of unanswered prayer. And so if you want things to change in that, you, you need to look at the owner's manual, which is the Bible. The Bible certainly tells us, here's the things that will get in the way of your prayer life. That's what I want to do is look at these six key things, these roadblocks that we need to address if we're going to uh, really, really get serious with God. Now, here's what, here's what uh, David says. David says, search me, O God. This is a dangerous prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything you find in me that makes you sad. Now, the context of this is he's praising God. He's all fired up earlier in the, the psalm. And then it, he just, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he, he, he re thinks about these people he knows that don't love God. In fact, they don't like God. They're, they they, they uh, think he's irrelevant. They, they, they mock him. They ridicule him. And so he just gets this anger going on. He goes, I hate people that hate you. And then he goes... I really hate him with like a hatred of hatred, you know, kind of like a hate with attitude or something. And really what he's saying is, is, hey, people that are just, you know, have, an, a, you know, a, 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 a dismiss you, uh, ridicule you, put you down. It just, that irritates me. And, and, then it, and then it grips him. Then he thinks, well, wait a minute. What if there's still a residue in me 
a little part of me because he there was a time when he was far from God and what if there was a residue in me that still holds on to something that's kind of like rebellious towards God and that's what gives rise to this statement here then he prays wait a minute instead of thinking about other people and their attitude and their dissing God and 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 relegating God to you know to uh, not important or 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 they say bad things and he says, what, what about me? Search me, God. See if there's anything in me. You know, I think that can happen to all of us. We're at work or with somebody and we start hearing people talking about, you know, or maybe it's on TV or on the radio. We hear people, you know, dissing God, talking bad about him. And we start to, it starts to rile us up, you know. And then, and then has there ever been a time when you think, well, what if there's still some stuff going on in me? So this is what the psalmist says, that's a dangerous prayer. In other words, th- let's just take a moment, not worry about what other people think. Not to worry about what other people are doing with their relationship with God. This is about, dangerous prayer begins with, what about me? Search me, O oh God. Is there anything, if so, point it out to me? That's what he says, and that's what we're looking at. So we're going to look at these roadblocks, things that God w- might point out to us. Six things. Number one, is prayerlessness. That certainly is a roadblock where we just don't even pray at all. It says, you want something, but you don't get it. You don't have what you want. Why? Well, you don't even ask God. Now, here's the thing. I know we talk about prayer a lot in church, and we talk, you know, about prayer as Christ followers, but I think some of the times the biggest difficulty with prayer, this might be number one, by the way, is that we don't actually pray. We talk about it. We'll say, hey, I'll pray about that. And we think about it. I need to pray about that. And we write it down. Well, I should pray about that. You know, and and, and we make a note of it. And we we tell ourselves, and we, you know, yeah, I mean, but the, the truth is, if you really look back, you never actually prayed. It was always, you know, yeah, I'm gonna do that. That's on my list. Yes, I, you know, that's important. We think about it. We tell ourselves, and and, and, but we never actually prayed about it. And that's one of the biggest challenges of all, I think, with unanswered prayer, is what he says right here. You never even asked. You never even actually asked about that and prayed. Think about the, some of the things that you're struggling with. You know, maybe you're struggling with your, in your marriage. And you think, well, you know, it's still the way it is. Well, have you actually prayed for your wife? Not, oh, God, help her out. I'm not talking about that kind of. I'm talking about an actual prayer where you kind of, hey, I'm going to spend some time actually verbally praying about my spouse or my kid or my parent or my friend or whatever the situation is or my health, whatever, and you actually verbalize it. So that's number one. The second thing I think is unconfessed sin. Now, I think we've talked about this every single message of this series because it is part it will certainly cause a problem it gets it causes junk to happen inside of us when i was a kid i used to i had a dirt bike and i used to race dirt bikes just for fun and uh, play around on you know and we had a big wash behind our our house and i'd go down the wash and especially when it was muddy i'd loved it when it was mud dirt bike was covered with mud i was covered with mud but you know when it was time to put gas in Mud was the enemy. You know, I'd clean it off, get it all. Then I'd get like a little handkerchief and I'd pour my gas through the handkerchief, making sure nothing at all gets in the engine so that it could uh, anything in there at all would junk it up, cause it to not to work right. And life is kind of like that. Where we're in the world, the Bible says we're in the world, we're not of the world. We're in it. We get muddy. We get, I mean, there's sin all around. There's lots of problems. There's, we get covered in mud, but... Inside our soul, the place where sin can get in, that needs to be kept pure. God wants us to have, we need to get that stuff out, clean it out. That sin causes blockages. It says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So it's not just sin, but in other words, it's okay. We just let that stay in there. We know it's wrong. We know God has said don't do it, but we kind of just hold on to that. I was reading this story about this preacher who uh, was real popular back in the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s, a guy named Norman Vincent Peale. And he's telling about this in one of his books 
about how he, uh, when he was a kid, he found this big stogie, this big cigar, and you know, in his household, you weren't supposed to smoke cigars, and so he gets this cigar, he goes into the back alley, he starts smoking, he doesn't really like it, but he kind of feels grown up, and all of a sudden, this guy starts coming up, this grown man starts coming down the alleyway, and it turns out it's his father, so he hides the cigar behind his, 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 his back, he tries to hide it from his dad, and then his dad wants to talk to him. And he's thinking, how do I get out of this? He notices the billboard of a circus coming to town. So he goes, Dad, can I go to the circus? Let's go to the circus. And, and here's what his dad says. He goes, son, he goes, never make a petition while at the same time trying to hide smoldering disobedience behind your back. He goes, I always remember that. And that applies to prayer. You know, we're going to God for prayer. And sometimes we're hiding something that we know is, is God said, don't do that, you know. We shouldn't be doing that, and, and, we're, and, and, and that just doesn't work well. That doesn't work well. It doesn't work well for humans. It certainly doesn't work, work well for God. Your sins are the roadblock. It's the roadblock between you and your God. That's why he doesn't answer your prayer. So there is, th- that can be a problem. You know, you have this roadblock, or we're holding on to something. This, I like that translation. It says, cherish sin. I want this. This is in my life. I don't want to get rid of it. That makes it unconfessed. And so, Really what he's saying here is this. Why should God honor your request when you don't honor his? He says, don't do that. That's not good for you. That's not helpful for you. That's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt others. And we, sometimes we understand that. And most times we don't. It just feels good. It's, it's, it, 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 it's comforting or whatever it does for us. And we want to hold on to it. This verse I like. We talk a lot about this when it comes to being free, when God wants to set you free. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. What we like to point out is is that in the Greek, you know, there's no punctuation, so there's no comma. And so really the emphasis becomes, for some people, it's all about if you obey his commands, it shows that you love him. So it's all about trying to live up to these rules and regulations and doctrines. and, and, And what happens is there's no life in that that is a that is eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what we talk about is in other words it's just it's not life-giving and, and and it's not satisfying and it's not doable but jesus puts the emphasis i believe on the love in other words if you love me in a love relationship you'll naturally want to do the things that i ask you to do it'll come easy it'll be life-giving Will you be perfect? No, of course not. But have you, or have you ever had a relationship with somebody where no matter what you do, they always find the bad? They always see, you know, you work so hard, you're doing something, you go, hey, what do you think? They find the one thing that you missed or the one thing, you know, they, I mean, that just sucks the life out of you, doesn't it? Yeah. And so that's, sometimes we project that onto God. That, that that's, he's just looking, he's looking for per- perfection. And that's all he wants from us. And so we'll never measure up. So why even try? No, he says, I want you to have a a relationship of love with me. And you're going to make mistakes, but I'm okay with that. Because out of that, you will have, that's, you'll be able to live the kind of obedience I'm looking for. God's love does not demand perfection. It produces obedience. We don't try to become, you know, good. We, we love God and let let him do what he needs to do. The Holy Spirit does that. Here's another one, number three, unresolved relational conflict. So often we try to separate that. We've got all our relational problems, and then we're trying to work things out with God. You know, and so we've got horizontal relationships, we've got the vertical relationship. They're not really connected. Jesus says over and over, they're very, very much connected. Here's one example. So when you offer your gift to God at the altar, Jesus says, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. So here the altar is the place where you actually connect with God. You, you go to him in prayer, you connect with God, you make your petitions there, you're, inter, you're, you're interacting with, with, with his divine spirit. And he says, you know what, you're kind of wasting your time. You need to go get that right. And often that's true. I mean, have you ever been praying and all of a sudden a mugshot of somebody comes into your mind, of somebody you're at war with? Ah, I hate that person. You know, and well, not only do you need to pray for that person, but he, Jesus is saying, you need to go get that right. 
You need to do what you need to do to get that right. He says, go and make peace with that person. And then come and offer your gift. He says, you could be right in the middle of church and they're ready to take the offering. Notice he says, leave the offering. You go ahead and stay. You know, I'm just kidding. The, the point is, is, he says, you need to go make that a priority. You need to make that a priority. You can't have close fellowship with God when you have a conflict with others. And so this is a hard truth that's very difficult for a lot of us because we want to separate those. We have horrible relationships with somebody or a couple people, and then we're trying to separate that, and God goes, that doesn't work like that. Here's an example. He says, husbands, you in turn must treat your wives with tenderness, viewing them as feminine partners who deserve to be honored, for they are co-heirs with you in the divine grace of life so that nothing, what, can hinder your prayers. He's saying that could be a roadblock. That can be a roadblock. You're married. You're at odds with your spouse. You haven't d- done what you need to do to try to resolve that or treat him better because that's that'll, call, that'll be a roadblock. That'll hinder your prayers. You'll start adding to that string of unanswered prayer. You'll get frustrated. You don't know where it's coming from. Well, he says this is certainly one of the options. In prayer, there's a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. And he says, if you refuse to do your part, then you cut yourself off from God's part. So they're connected. It's very important. Now, as I said last week, you can't all, obviously, when you're trying to resolve conflict, it takes two people. So he makes it very clear, you do your part. You can't control somebody else. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with everybody. So there's a part you do, that's all God holds you accountable to. You've done your part. You've done, and that's, that's the hard part. Again, you can't make somebody do something, but you certainly can own up to your part. Number four is inadequate faith. Inadequate faith that, you know, you're always kind of wondering, you know, does God have the power? Does God have the strength? Is he able to do this? You know, and just, there's, you know, a lot of people that struggle with that. He says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. So there's this part where we need to step in in our faith because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He's talking about prayer. He's saying this is a roadblock when you're always struggling, wondering, oh, will God come through? Can he do it? Uh, Is he able to do it? He says, no, we need to stand on that. You know, it's so interesting that in our society, we actually do function in faith on, on, on a lot of things. And we don't think anything of it. You get sick, you go to the doctor, you can barely say his name. He gives you a, a prescription, you can't even read it. You go to a pharmacist you've never met, never see again. You get a medicine, you don't understand it, and then we just take it. Whoop, I'll just take that. I just trust, you know what I mean? That's acting in faith. And so God has prescriptions. He says, do this. And faith is stepping into that and doing it. But when we get caught up in the doubt, I don't know, you know, that's, we don't do that when we're taking medication in most cases. And in other things, we just, we just step, oh, yeah, let's just do it. That's the answer. Well, God says that's what he wants from us. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So that's a big thing. That's real high up there. He goes, hey, Jesus talks about mountain-moving prayer, mountain-moving prayer. And he wants it, and some of us have mountains, certainly. How do we grow in our faith? Well, part of how we grow in our faith is by spending time with God in his word and in prayer. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, you know, you know, I actually like this where it says hearing by the word of God. Because, you know, audio books are all the rage right now, right? Audio Bible. Here's a, a verse because, you know, a lot of people didn't read back then. A lot of people didn't have access to that anyways. And so he's talking about, hey, most people, that's how they, they got the word of God is, is they, they heard it. Well, you know, I think that's kind of funny. 2,000 years later, that's how most people get it today, is, is they don't read the Bible, but they'll listen to it on their Bible app or they'll listen to it in their car. That's okay. It's one of the ways that God grows your faith. So stepping into that, saying, God, I believe that you are going to do this. The more you are convinced of God's ability, the more he demonstrates his ability to you. And so it's a cycle. You kind of grow in that. But there's a difference between passive faith and active faith. Passive faith is, yeah, God can do it. And I think most of us would agree with that, right? Can God intervene on your behalf? 
Yeah, he can. But active faith is saying, but I believe he will. I believe he will. So it's different. Passive faith, I believe he can. Active faith, I believe he will, and he's going to do it right now. Stepping into it. Hey, God's active today. He's, the Bible calls him the living God. What does that mean? He's doing stuff right here, right now, in our world, in our lives. And so when you start to believe that, you start to see your prayer life go up and your answered prayer go up as well. Lastly, actually not lastly, I have two more. Impatience. Impatience. I guess I'm impatient with getting to the end here. Impatience. Because that... That can be a problem, right? We, when do most of us want our prayers answered? Yesterday? You know, like, hey, come on. You know, kids do that, right? They're in the car. When are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? Oh, you know, and you realize, oh, this is going to be a long, long trip. Kid gets to six. Dad, I'm six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I want a phone. I want to be able to play games on my phone. I want to be able to download TikTok. And let the Chinese spy on me. No, I don't know. <laughs> I want to be able to do all that. Or, Dad, I'm nine. And I, you know, and the little girl says, I want to wear tights. And I want to wear makeup every day. And, we, you know, it just goes on and on. And we're, we're always in a hurry trying to race things. And there's a kid inside of us as adults. You know, and, and we just say, God, I want this and I want it now. I want it now. It's so hard for us. To wait, don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled in a flame. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. And so when it does get difficult, when we're saying, hey, I don't want to wait anymore, and we get impatient, he says, no, that, that can be, that can be a, a roadblock. In fact, what he wants you to know is, is God's delays are not necessarily his denials. We often take it as a denial, so we give up. Well, I already prayed for this three times. It didn't happen. Boom. Well, sometimes we need to pray more than that. And continue to pray, because sometimes there is a delay that's involved, a delay. Lastly, wrong requests. Sometimes there are just requests that, that are not the right request. They're wrong. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him according to his will. So that's the key is we want to be praying, God, is this your will? I want to be doing, and, you know, and so that sometimes he, there, there is a no. I mean, a couple examples is we have uh, James and John, Peter, James, and John. They go to this mountain with Jesus, and it becomes what is known as the Mount of Transfiguration because Jesus transfigures. The glory of God comes all around Jesus. And they're like so blown out of the water when all of this is finished. They go to Jesus and they go, oh my goodness, we need to just stay here and bask in your glory and bask in the glory of what just happened. Let's build some shelters and hang out here for a while. Well, that was the wrong request. Jesus said no. He goes, we have a mission. There's people that need to hear about, hear about the good news of Christ. And, you know, I mean, so he, he, he says no. And James and John, again, they they're go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, when you go into your glory, can we have some privileged seats? Like, I want to be on your right and then on the left, on the, either on your right and your left. We want to have, like, privileged seats. And Jesus says, no. No, nope. can't honor that request. Then another time, James and John, they're going somewhere and they're, they don't get a permit. They're denied a permit into where they want to go. They get so angry they want to just roast this place. Here's how it goes. When the disciples, James and John, learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning down out of the sky? Have you ever felt like that, like somebody irritates you so much? Hmm, if I only had the power, bolt of lightning, you know, and incinerate them. Jesus turned to them, of course not. Why? This is the wrong request. And sometimes there are requests that are, that are wrong. But by and large, God wants us, he wants, he wants to bless us. He there's so many things that we know are his sovereign will. Healing is his sovereign will. There's a lot of things that we know that it's not sovereign meaning we see Jesus healing everywhere. We see healing all throughout the Bible. God's called the God, the, the God of healing in the Bible. And so we know that's, and, and, and we know that that's, that's a good thing. And so that's when we pray for healing, we know in general we're praying for 
something that's aligned with his will. Does it always happen? No, it didn't happen for Paul. Paul evidently had some kind of physical ailment. He needed healing. He prayed about it. And God said no. So sometimes it is no, but in general, it's yes. And so when we're praying for restored relationships, again, his sovereign will we know. He likes relationships resolved that are in conflict. And so when we pray, God, give me the courage for that. Give me the right words. Give me the right timing. You're praying alongside his will. That's a good request. So there's a lot of requests that we can step boldly and confidently into. Boldly and confidently into. If the request is wrong, God will just say no. If the timing is wrong, God will say slow. You know, it's not going to happen, but keep praying. If you, are, if you are wrong, God will say grow. Sometimes it's us. There's something in us God wants to grow in us. Our character, our trust, our, our, our faith. There's things that God's doing in us. But if you get all those things right, God says, let's go. And we go into prayer and we go, God, do something great. And God starts to move. We start to see some amazing things happen. I want to go back to this verse, NIV translation. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know anxieties and know anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. And so just be, have, that's a dangerous prayer. Say, saying, God, these roadblocks we looked at, is there any of that stuff going on in me? Because if you shake loose some of that stuff, you move forward, you'll see your prayer life change. You'll see answered prayers start to really happen in your life. And my friends, we need that. We need that in our lives. We need that in our, in our, in our relationships, at work, in our communities, and certainly in our nation. We need that. We need people that are stepping out and trusting God. But it begins with a dangerous prayer like that. So let's pray. Father, I just go to you right now and just ask, Holy Spirit, come search us. Search us, oh God. And I invite you to make that personal. If you're online or you're here with us in the auditorium, just say, search me, God. Let us, the Holy Spirit take that spotlight. Maybe it's one of these areas. Maybe it's just prayerlessness. The truth is, you talk about prayer. You might even believe in prayer. But you don't pray. Or if you pray very little. God's saying, I want to change that. Speak it out. Say what you want. How about this area of unconfessed sin? Just kind of, you're comfortable with it. You just, that's who you are. You've, it's been with you for this long. You know God's not happy with it. It doesn't honor him. Why not just say, God, I want to just let you deal with that. You know, that's a courageous prayer just by itself. You might not even know your way out of this. You might not even want to give it up because it's, there's a, a familiarity with it. But if you give God an opening, he will start to do something in your life. And you say, God, you start to deal with it. I don't know how to walk out of this. I'm stuck here. I've been here for a long time. But I give you permission to start changing things. That's a dangerous prayer. What about unresolved conflict with somebody? go, yeah, but it's mostly their fault. Well, you own up to the part that's on you. You say, you know, that's unresolved conflict. Yeah, but they've hurt me. They might hurt me again. On and on and on and on. But you know what? Jesus knew all of that, but he says, this is important. This is important, how we treat other people. They're not separate. So you go, you just muster up incredible courage. You might need people praying for you. Might be beyond your capacity. Most For most people, conflict and trying to do conflict resolution is one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing they can, they can experience in life. It's just overwhelming. But God will give you the strength. And that could be a roadblock in your prayer life. What about 
this area of impatience. It's not. I don't want to wait. I don't want to persevere. Or inadequate faith. I mean, we put faith in so many other things. God says, just trust me. Trust me. If you've never put your faith in Christ, that is the first and greatest act of faith you'll ever do. Where you just go to God and you say, God, thank you for sending Jesus Christ. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be able to do those rules to prove I love you. It doesn't, and you know what? It doesn't work like that anyway. You go to God and you say, God, I love you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Help me to discover how much you love me and enter into a relationship and let that affect everything else. If you've never done that, do that right now, right where you're at. Just go to God. Say, God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for sending, for going to the cross for me, for stretching your arms out, dying for my sin, my unbelief, all the things, my, my illnesses, my brokenness, my frailties. And would you say, God, strengthen me with your Holy Spirit. I want to follow you. I want to walk with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.